you can definitely incorporate geomantic figures and geomantic symbology and the algorithms of geomancy into most magical situations. It just takes a little bit of ingenuity for it. I never thought about geomantic magic for whatever reason. And in my limited knowledge of geomancy, it was always just a yes or no, really balls on accurate divination system, and that was it. That's really what my goal was for this ebook on geomantic magic, Secreti Geomantici, was not so much to say, here are the forms of geomantic magic you can do, but here are some examples of things you can experiment. Visualize a door with the figure that you're going to visualize emblazoned on the door. So, you've decided that you're going to get serious about geomancy. So you, yeah, exactly, right? This is the oh. universal symbol of I'm serious about something. Damaro. You've learned some meditation to calm your mind down before you do the divination. You've also spent some time contemplating each of the figures you recommend at least once a week but I mean ideally like more frequently and it takes about four months if you do a figure once a week three months four months yeah four months yeah if you can I recommend doing again one figure a day maybe one figure every day of a week if you can and then maybe once you're finished with all 16 figures go through them again See what more you can add. Now that you've experienced all 16 individual worlds, what more can you pick up? Or, or and, you could also do combinations of figures. So instead of just doing a path working for Tristitia or for Coniuncio, what about Puer plus Puella equals Coniuncio? What does that world of a reaction look like unto itself? That goes to 256 new doors to go through which could take the better part of a year. Well, you know what? To me, that's the most challenging part. The figures individually, I get it. You know, like, I, I really get it. There's only 16, and they're pretty fucking clear. But it's when I'm looking at the right witness and the left witness and looking at the judge, and sometimes I'm just like, how did this happen? The witnesses look fine, yeah. and the judge is just like bad news. Would you imagine all three figures on the door that you're going to open? What I would do is... Have one figure emblazoned on the door first, and then the second figure, and then the light from both those figures mingling to form a third underneath. And then that way, on the door, you have all three figures. And so when you open the door, you're walking through the world of that specific combination. To give an astrological parallel, you could do a path working for Mars. Okay, simple enough. Imagine a door with a symbol for Mars on it. You can also do a symbol, you know, a door for Mars in Aries. So you can really expand on any simple symbol by bringing it into the context of a second symbol, where combined they form one distinct force. It's like if I, if you're going to meet me in my own house, I'm going to act differently and treat you differently than if you meet me in the office, or you're going to meet me at a temple, or you're going to meet me at a bar. You'll see different faces of me, different aspects. It's still all me. But then, what's the context you meet me? You can get a good understanding of Puer, but if you want to know how Puer interacts with Puella and why Kunyung shows the answer, you want that specific door. You recommend that before you do these contemplations, just fill your mind with as much, I guess, like uh, left brain information about the figure. You know, just yeah. read a lot and just all that analytical exactly. stuff. First fill your mind with that. And then you open the door and go more into the right brain. And the reason why I suggest doing that kind of preliminary study is your mind can't make connections if there's nothing to connect. Like, for instance, they did a study that you're, you literally cannot visualize a face that you have not seen before. If your mind hasn't been exposed to even the basic knowledge, there's nothing to build on. And at that point, the mind really is just reaching out, and that can be dangerous and misleading. I really think that getting your ebook would be a great idea, even if you don't want to do geomantic magic. Just a third of the book is a great, like, not super beginner primer, but it's a really great sort of crash course on hermetic sort of correspondences in other systems. The first third is teaching you not so much about the geomancy, but sort of like the the 
underpinning the cosmology, of the worldview. The worldview. So when you get to the middle part, a part about the divination, you're ready. And then mm -hmm. when you get to the ritual part, which is the last third, you're super ready. Let's say that I'm really into this guy and I want to know, will he ask me out? Yes or no? So I create this chart and it's not looking that great, right? It's not looking that great. What do I do if I want to start doing magic with that? So you have a need, you know, I want John Doe to fall for me. So I want John Doe to get his head between my thighs. Mm -hmm. How can we make this happen? Well, magic. I mean, magic has been used since we first started having thoughts. You know, yes, everyone wants to say, oh, magic should be used for higher ends and elevation and ascension bullshit. Magic's been used for two things since the dawn of time. Getting laid and getting paid. So yeah. you may as well follow suit. Mm -hmm. So there's absolutely ways to have people fall in love with you or to find the right person to fall in love with you, which is arguably a better choice. But let's say, okay, so you have your heart set on one dude, you know, to ask you out. Maybe you want the dude, maybe you just want to go out with the dude. Depends. Well, magic could be an option. So in that case, if the chart for Will John Doe asks me out, if that chart isn't looking so good, drop another chart and say, can I use magic to get John Doe to ask me out? And then see how that works. Not just for geometric magic, but for magic in general, it is absolutely necessary to do a preliminary divination for a ritual, except when it isn't. And I qualify that a lot because... I want to be an upstanding, responsible magician and diviner and say, before you do any kind of ritual, you should do divination to see whether magic is called for. It is absolutely good, if not necessary, to have as much figure out from the get-go, again, so you can do the least amount of work as time goes on, the least net amount of work. Now, in saying that, I am a terrible hypocrite, because I rarely do divination before ritual. But then again, the reason why that's the case for me is half the time I'm experimenting. And I don't know what a ritual will be like to begin with. I want to know what the effects are. And these are things that a divination reading can't necessarily tell you. Like, will a divination, like, will this ritual work? Okay, sure, awesome. But what will it really be like? What will some of the effects be like? I don't even know what to begin asking for that. The other cases when I wouldn't do divination before ritual, if it's something so routine, and if my intuition's already screaming out that this thing needs to be done in this way, at that point, divination's kind of obviated by that. So, like, for instance, if I'm going to my Hermes shrine, to, you know, do a regular, standard, routine offering of wine and oil and prayer. You know, nothing fancy, nothing special. Like, I know what I'm getting into. I know what my ends are. I've done it a thousand times before. Hermes and I have a good relationship. There's nothing surprising there, so there's nothing really to ask about. But if I'm doing client work, where I can't afford to be wrong, where I can't afford to mess up, where I can't afford to have ritual not work, then absolutely I will do preliminary divination to see should they bother paying for this ritual? Like, do they really need me to do magic for them on their behalf? Like, I'm not going to rip someone off and, you know, say, oh, you need to give me $1,000 so I can do X, Y, Z for you, because clearly you need it when all they need is, like, a good bath. So is magic necessary for them? And then sometimes am I the right one to help them? Sometimes, even if I have the right you know, skill set, if I have the right knowledge about the situation, I still may not be the right one to help them. That could happen. And then, will this ritual work for them? And if yes, okay. If no, okay, what else can we do instead? So it sounds like you may possibly draw up four or five different charts after the initial shield chart. I mean, in practice, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. because... With enough skill and practice, you can kind of read all of that into one chart. You know, will X happen? And then, can I use magic to do X? And then, if yes, then that chart will give you hints as to go this route, be aware of this, focus on this. You know, that, that can kind of all be read into the same chart. 
But if I really needed as much detail, yes, I would break it down to several charts. But that's so rare that I can't really think of an example off the top of my head where I had to do that. Okay, let's say that the original shield chart, the right witness was Quella. Okay. And the left witness was uh, Rubeus, right? Okay. In this case, you have Quill, right witness, Rubeus is left witness, and V is the judge. Yeah. Okay. So V is not necessarily bad, but... It's it, heavy in change. It's heavy in change. It's unstable. Um, and so that gives me the inkling that maybe magic will help, because at least things seem kind of like, okay, it can be changed, it can be steered. Yes, exactly. Now, if the judge was uh, Carker, would, I mean, I would definitely do a chart to ask, should I do magic on this, right? Because Carker is, like, very stable. It's kind of, like, not a situation that can be changed easily. It depends. I mean, consider the Haitian Revolution. You know, where, you know the slaves in Haiti were freed, and they won their independence. You know, they were literally in chains, and they broke free of their slave masters, and they became independent, both freedom as, you know, ex-slaves and freedom as a nation to themselves. They were literally in chains. They were literally in prison the entire time as slaves, and they did magic to get what they needed. You can do magic while in prison. You can do magic to fix most any situation. If it's truly set in stone by fate, by God, you can do magic still to at least improve your condition within the boundaries set up for you. And again, Carker's all about boundaries. You may be able to change those boundaries, but you can change what happens inside of them. So even if the judge were Carker or Populous, there's still some possibility for magical use. Via is great for magic because literally everything's up in the air. It could change at the drop of a hat. You could, you know... It can go left one second and right the next. But if you breathe the right direction, it can go forward. Carker, you have boundaries to work within. Populous, you just have a still lake. Will you disturb it, or will you dive in? This is so exciting when I hear this, because, you know, I was under the impression that these geomantic charts, for whatever reason, maybe because they are so yes and no, and they deal with such, you know, like the four elements, they seem so... I don't know, they just seem so set in stone. Um, maybe because they are so simple and they just seem so much like, this is the way it's gonna be. But actually, you can create a chart one month and then do some magic, create the same sort of, um, use the same query the next month and it may be radically different, correct? Absolutely, that can absolutely happen, yes. Because, for instance, if you're going to the doctor, let's say you have you know, some kind of illness, you go to the doctor, the doctor will give you prognosis literally foreknowledge, and saying, okay, well, as you are now, here's how things will progress. Here's what will happen to you. But if you take this set of treatments, here's a different prognosis with a different forecasting of what will happen to you. If you go with this treatment, here's a different prognosis. So it's the same underlying condition, but based on your actions having known what you know, that's the important thing. You can take different actions to change it. Sometimes people will do what they're going to do, regardless of what you do. Sometimes events are going to happen no matter what. But you can be at least, at least you can be in a different state of readiness. If you do a reading, for instance, let's say you're going to get robbed in a back alley. Well, you can avoid going to back alleys. But fate may have it so that you have to end up in one for one reason or another. So you may carry a knife on you. But let's say you lose your knife or forget to bring your knife that day. Well, then you can have a spirit hang off your background who will at least be watching out for you and will let you know, hey, be careful, bring a friend with you. Or, hey, I know who that is. I'll let you know who that, that person is so you can file a police report and have them get caught and get your stuff back. If something has to happen, it has to happen. How it happens can be under your influence, whether or not it has to happen. That's kind of the whole fate versus free will kind of distinction as I see it. 
You know, I recall in the Iliad, the ancient Greek epic, uh, there was a talk between, I want to say Aphrodite and Hephaestus or Poseidon, I forget. I think it's Poseidon, who built the walls of Troy. And, you know, the Iliad describes the Trojan War. And Troy was destined to fall. That was literally its fate. Troy was supposed to be conquered by the Greeks. And it was a 10-year-long siege. And Aphrodite, you know, wanted Troy to survive. It had to end at some point. But Poseidon was the one who built the walls and fortifications for Troy. And he said, well, Aphrodite, if you had asked me, I would have made the fortifications last for 100 years instead of 10. It still had to fall, but they could at least live longer. That's the whole kind of, if it has to happen, it has to happen, but you get a say in how it happens. That's what I love about magic, and that's one of the reasons why, as a skeptic, I softened my stance. Because the fact that, you know, like there is a fatalism to a lot of skepticism as well, versus a magical worldview, there's so much more agency a person can have. It just has so many practical uses. Like, to me, this is all very practical. Super duper practical. So, okay, you really want this guy, okay? Super, super practical, right? And then you make a chart that says, will magic work on this situation? Mm -hmm. And then you come up with that specific chart with the lots of the populace. All right, so yeah. this would be a good example chart. Okay. Uh, first mother is populace. Mm -hmm. Second mother is populace. Third mother is Puella. Mm -hmm. And the fourth mother is Via. Yeah. The court for this chart, the right witness is Urbeus, the left witness is Albus, and the judge is Kuriyoshio. Now, this is a chart about magic, so we're looking for specific significators that involve magic. But because it's magic for love, or for fucking at least, you know, you also want to see things, how it ties into that. And the judge here is Kuriyoshio, which is literally coming together. It's been described as two people having sex on a bed. So that's already a great indication here. Yeah. So when it comes to reading about magic in a chart, for the magic you do, you want to look at the 8th house and the ninth house. Why those houses? The ninth house, and I'll start there because it's a little bit easier to talk about, is high magic. Ninth house talks about religion. It talks about divinity. It talks about philosophy. It talks about higher education. So they really have the highest faculties of the mind. So it involves religious magic. It involves praying psalms from the Bible. It involves working with angels. It involves astrology. It involves astrological magic. It involves prophecy. It involves, you know, even if truly high up there, the high, not necessarily white light, but the really high divine theurgy kind of magic. The eighth house is about dead, the dead, ghosts, death, inheritances, old things. It's low magic. It's working with devils and demons and ancestors and spirits of the dead. It's working your own witchcraft. It's working with poisons and potions. So basically the distinction between ninth house and eighth house here is ninth house is high magic, eighth house is low magic. So for me, if I were to conjure an, an, the angel of Mars, Kamael, that would be ninth house. If I were to do an astrological talisman, that would be ninth house. If I were to do candle magic, that would be eighth house. If I were to make a oil, that would be eighth house. So the focus here is really on the technique you want to use. High magic versus low magic. In general, I hate using that distinction, but in terms of the astrological house chart here, it actually makes sense. So in this specific chart, we're looking at connections with the eighth house or ninth house. The figure in the first house, your significator, is populous. Turns out, populous is also in the ninth house. So we have perfection by occupation there, which indicates absolutely that astrological or angelic or other high magic is the way to go. Now, because the eighth house and the ninth house are inherently neighbors, you could say that it's a perfection by conjunction with the eighth house, and that you could use low magic, but let's be honest, you have an occupation with the ninth house. 
use the ninth house. That's really the better thing to use here. Because Pappas is a figure of the moon, you might want to work with Gabriel, the angel of the moon, or you could work with Hecate. But because Pappas is a figure specifically of the waxing and full moon, you probably want to do something around that time specifically because there's so much lunar influence in this chart. So Gabriel, for perhaps getting into his dreams or, you know, making him feel comfortable around you or just wearing lavender, you know, that nice lavender perfume. Maybe something sheer next time you see him. You know, glamour work is really a vile kind of magic. Making you look nicer. Not necessarily prettier, but more there for him. I see that Populous, it is in House 2, House 9, and House 12. So it's kind of all over the place here. Yeah, lots of lunar influence in this chart, too. Right. But I'm and gonna... solar influence as well. Because if you are the first house, and then John Doe will be the seventh house. Mm -hmm. In this chart, John Doe will be represented by Fortuna Major. Fortuna Major is also in House 8. And in House 5. So not only is John Doe already looking for sex, the House 5 connections, at least for you at least, but he also has a connection with magic, which indicates he could be involved some way in the woogity woogity woo woo stuff. And thus, because that connection, because he's already neighboring your significator through House 8 and 9, you have an even stronger indication that magic you do is going to more easily reach him. Plus the inherent duality of the sun and the moon coming together. And as the judge here is Konyungshio, coming together, so many good significations start that magic absolutely would be the way to work. I am a little bit um, curious about what it means that Populous is in House 12. Because in the ah. book, it talks about House 12 being the house of curses. Yes. So, in general, about the magic you do, you want to look at House 8 and House 9. House 6 is the magic that other people do for you on your behalf. Because House 6 involves employees, it involves servants, it involves people doing things to you as a service. So, for instance, if you were to hire me to do a ritual for you, the magic involved here would be House 6, because you're not doing magic. You're hiring me as an employee to do magic for you. The opposite of that is House 12, magic done against you. So it is curses, it is crosses, it is hexes, it is the magical problems you get into. And if you look in traditional literature, you'll see that they talk explicitly about witchcraft and curses being associated with House 12, along with poisoners and betrayers. Oh dear. Because what is House 12? If you are a House 1, okay, you're in House 1, the stuff right in front of you, in this case my wine, is House 2. Because 2 follows 1. 1 faces 2. That means House 12 is behind you. Mm -hmm. It's what you can't see. It's the stuff going on behind your back in the shadows. And the moon has a whole dark side. So it's not necessarily a bad thing here. Because Pappas is both in House 1, House 2, and House 12, basically you got all your bases covered, and you have eyes both in the front and the back of your head. But it also indicates that you need to watch out for the illusions you put off, because you could be ensnared in your own illusions. You know, case in point, you're talking about love magic here. And love magic has a danger if you're going after a specific person. You could become obsessed with the person. They could become obsessed over you, but you could just easily obsess with the person as well. And that's a major danger. Maybe John Doe's a douchebag, but you can't get over him. That could be a backfire that House 12 could indicate. You get lost in the confusion and obsession. Could it also literally mean that he has, like, 20 different, like, baby mamas who are trying to actively do magic against you? I wouldn't necessarily say that, because I would look to house, his house 5, which would be your house 11. You rotate the chart. And here it's Albus, which isn't a big deal. If anything, he's probably sterile or, like, does, is, like, already past child interest in children. 
or just doesn't have interest in children. Mm -hmm. So, okay. This chart seems to indicate magic, yes. Yes. High magic, yes. Um, the judge seems to be yes. Yes. <laughs> But why is there Albus in the uh, left witness? This is what I mean about the witnesses and the judge like combination like totally throwing me off. I get the right witness, right? You you want to you, you want to hook up, fine. But then the future is going to be this like sort of like very Doctor Spock sort of energy with Albus. Like, how does that make you know what is it? Conjunctio, conjunctio. I say conjunct show for class black sensation, but you could say conjunct show, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that make so, that? So, you could interpret, you know, the right, sorry, my right witness, the judge, and left witness as past, present, future. Or, me, them, interaction. Mm -hmm. And them, in this case, isn't necessarily John Doe, it's whatever you're facing. And remember, this chart's about magic. So what is the magical reality facing you? So here we have all this, which is a figure of coolness, a figure of calmness, a figure of really wizened experience. You know, white, pure, cool. But look at the house chart. Look at what's already telling you. You have populous, the full moon, the full white pure moon, a figure of stability and calmness and inertia, in House Nine, house of religious, divine, compassionate but without passion magic. So, you know, praying the Bible, or you know, working with angelic magic. You know, very high, lofty, calm, cool things that's already involving with the large, full, white moon, all that is also Albus. Albus is coolness and purity. You want to work pure, cool magic. So for, in this case, it's really reflecting the same thing. And I guess that just comes with experience and intuition that you would be able to make that connection, right? It does take intuition and also takes, again, correspondences. You know, knowing how things connect. Even if you're not trying to get from my left foot to fall, you know, you can still make certain connections that, if they don't necessarily connect, they can reflect. And knowing that all this is also a figure of Mercury, which is um, the planet of magic, knowing that Konyungshu is also Mercury-ruled, you know, magic's being strongly indicated here, along with the perfection of populace from House 1 to House 9, reflecting cool, elevated forms of magical working. And then you mentioned in your book, like, the ritual itself would be House 10? Kind of. So the reason why I'd say ritual is House 10 is because in a medical chart, if House 6 is the illness you're going through, and House 7 is the doctor you're seeing, House 10 is the regimen prescribed for you to follow. It's the treatment for the disease. So in that sense, I associate House 10 with the ritual, because it's the treatment for the thing you're trying to fix. But really, you could also read that into House 8 and 9, depending on what connects, or what perfects, rather, with House 1. Um, if neither of them perfect, then maybe you can't do magic. Maybe you need to have someone do magic for you on your behalf, or maybe you just need to find a more mundane way about going about things. It depends. So let's say that you get this chart of, you know, will magic work, and it says yes, it will. You're mm -hmm. excited. Yes. Uh, what do you do next? Well, knowing that magic works, I could take the advice implied by the chart to go with like lunar high magic. Or I can just start doing whatever. Knowing that magic works, that's all I really needed to know. Mm -hmm. So then I just do magic. If I have a specific ritual in mind, you know, that I was strongly inclined to do, I do it. If I really wanted to make sure I was doing the right kind of magic, I'd probably take the advice of this chart and say, well, and I would specifically take the advice of this chart because so much of it ties together so cleanly and so neatly, that's really strongly indicating to go in a particular path. 
But if I didn't get that kind of, you know, consistency in such a chart, if I just got a simple yes with little else to go on, then I'd look through my books. I'd say, I feel like this ritual today. Let's do this ritual. And then I'd go ahead and do it. Your book talks about making sigils with geometric yeah. figures. And I think a lot of people, um, they're really comfortable doing that first, you know, making sigils. And um, so if you wanted to do that, how would you, which sigil would you make? How would you do that entire process for this chart? So I actually am not a big fan of using geometric sigils, oh. but they are a staple of geometric magic. And the way you make a geometric sigil is you literally just play connect the dots. Like, you have the dots of a figure of geomancy, make a picture from the dots. So, like, connect the lines, maybe make a circle or a square or, you know, a Y. You know, it's really simple. And there's a well-known set of pre-made geometric sigils that you can find in Cornelius Agrippa and Barrett's The Magus and John Michael Greer's Art Practice of Geomancy and any other number of texts. So, and they're well-known. Or you can make up your own. Do what you want. Um, and you're not really doing that much special. You're just making more of a symbol rather than a proper geometric figure. Uh, so instead of a series of dots, you have a letter shape, almost, if you will. And then you use that as any other glyph. Like you'd use a symbol for Mars, for a Mars talisman. You'd use a symbol for Ares, for an Ares talisman. One of the interesting things, though, about the geometric sigils is that you can connect the dots in any number of ways. So you can have 10 different sigils for a single figure and it all be the same figure but different sigils. So for instance, knowing that the Kabbalistic number of Mars is five, you could have five candles each engraved with a different symbol for puer. That's the way I'm going at doing that. I know uh, Dr. Al Cummins, who's also another awesome geomancer, um, he experiments using the individual sigils as separate entities unto themselves. Like, I've seen him do candle working where he's doing an acquisition working, you know, gain, where he has six candles, you know, two, one, two, one. And each candle will have a different sigil of acquisition on it. Would you use the um, populace or would you use the con conjunctio? I, I can't even say that word. Um, <laughs> Just say how you can. It's yeah. Conjunctio, conjunctio. Yeah, conjunctio. conjunctio. Um, would you use a sigil for populace or conjunctio if you wanted to create sigils? Would you want to lock in that conjunctio or would you want to work more with that populace, that full moon energy? That's a good question. I mean, my main goal is to get with John Doe in this case. Yes. I would probably use conjunction in this case, because I want to get together with him. And conjunction is conjunctions coming together. But I'd probably flavor that with a couple of lunar things. Like, i do it under the light of a full moon. Um, I'd probably use sensuous, good-feeling, relaxing smells. You know, wear nice robes. You know... Nice, sleepy things that you know, put people at ease. You know, for the end result of bringing John Doe closer to me so I can get together with him, I want to put him at ease so he can open up to me. We can talk and share things and just relax together. You know, that's the kind of approach I would take. So I would probably use Conjunctio, in this case, as a sigil. Um, amplified by the power of the moon. You know, perhaps pick a full moon on a Wednesday or Monday or Wednesday, day of the moon or day of Mercury, perhaps hour of the moon, day of Mercury, or hour of Mercury and day of the moon, some combination thereof, um, and then see what goes from there. I mean, you could actually make the sigil, and, why, and after you make the sigil, you could probably put another thing on top of it, which is using the mudras, the, the hand symbols. Yes. Right? Yes. I feel like I'm throwing gang signs right now. But, I know, right? <laughs> Al and I talked about that before, basically, yeah. Yeah, like, I didn't know this, but you can actually shape your hands in 16 different ways to correspond to each of the geometric figures. Like, how, how did that happen? <laughs> like, so, figure this out. So, you know, palm reading's always been an ancient art. 
And they've always associated, you know, different planets and elements and whatever with different parts of the hand. And I had the idea of, you know, basically representing the four fingers as the four lines of a geometric figure. Fire, air, water, earth. If the finger is long, then you have two points. Your hand is open. You know, it can accept things. It can, you know, give things. But if the finger is pressed down to the palm, then it's closed. You have one point. So, for instance, the open palm will be populous because you have even, 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 all open. If I put my two middle fingers in, I have conjunctio because fire is two points. It's long. Earth is two points long. But air and water have both one point. Therefore, they're closed. Coincidentally, this is also the American Sign Language for I love you, which is fitting for a show. But it's also the horns, too. Like the horns of Mercury or the horns of the devil, because it's also a magical symbol, symbol, this mudra. If you have fire passive, air passive, but water and earth active, you have Fortuna Major. And this is the traditional symbol for blessing someone in the Catholic Church. Right. You know, bless you, my child. But you also end up with this for Puella. <laughs> so, I mean, just take that how you will. So what do you do with your thumb when you're doing these? Whatever is most comfortable. You could be um, doing the sigil thing, doing the candle thing, doing the mudra thing. But then you also talk about angels with the geomantic figures. Yes. And that sounds so, hardcore. So in Hermetic cosmology, everything has a ruling angel. You know, all the individual signs have a ruling angel. The sphere of the fixed stars as a whole has a ruling angel. Each planet has a ruling angel. Each element has a ruling angel. It only stands a reason that each geometric figure would also have a ruling angel. And unfortunately, we don't know what they are. No one's ever written about them before. And I wanted to know what the angelic names would be. And you can you know, calculate them or tabulate them based on a number of rules. Nick Farrell has a method where he basically uses the Greeks, uh, sorry, the Greek vowels and the Greek consonants in certain pairs based on the ruling planet and element of a figure. But I took almost a naively simple approach. So, for instance, my name is Sam, or in he, you know, the full name is Samuel, which is a Hebrew name, meaning God has heard. You take Shmu, you know, Shmu or Shem, uh, which is the Hebrew word for hearing, and add on the theophoric suffix El. Shmuel, Samuel, God has heard. And that way of, you know, attaching a theophoric or divine ending to a word to make a new word, or a new name, rather, is long-standing practice. Like, for instance, Gabriel literally means God's strength. And the root of that word is the same as Geburah, as in the Sephiroth, Geburah from the Tree of Life, because Geburah is strength. So Geburah, Yel, Gabriel, the strength of God. So knowing that this has been done, all I did was just take the Hebrew names of the figures and just added on El to them. That's all I did. Wait, and it so works. you basically needed some angels, so you were just like, I'm just going to name them. Like, this is this is Sam. This is Sam being like, I need some angels. This is your name, your name, your name, your name. Shit works. <laughs> so, Love it. Love it. I mean, it's, it's very, like I said, it's naively simple to the point of being stupid. But we see this practice done elsewhere in religion and in magic where you just take the name of a thing and then make it divine. And then you have the divinity of the thing. So because they're so generic and so vague, I still recommend that once you make contact with these angels, you get their specific name for your usage of them. Just like how there's the general meaning of a figure, but your visualization, your contemplation, your path with the figure can give you a unique perspective on it. You kind of want that unique connection with the angelic uh, divinities of the figures themselves as well. 
do these angelic figures, do they have sigils attached to their names? So I make a distinction between sigil and seal. They're both symbols of a spirit. But a seal is a glyph that the spirit themselves provide. It is given by them as a whole. It can't be broken down. It can't really be analyzed. It can't be, you know, it's, anatom it's atomic. It is a unit unto itself. A sigil is a glyph that you develop according to a rule. So the sigils I provide in the book, I basically use the rose cross Hebrew letter wheel, where you have the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet plotted in three concentric rings. And then you just plot the names on the letters and see this, you know, the lines from playing connect the dots looks like. And that's the story you use. And those work just to get started. If the angel wants you to keep using them, let's say keep using it. But if you ask them for their own seal for you to use, they'll give you, when you conjure them, they'll give you a special symbol, a seal, a glyph for you to use with them. Let's say that I want to just dive in deep. I just really want this guy, so I'm just going to do a shit ton of magic, right? So I want to do all of it. All right. Uh, how would I do that? How would I layer it in the most efficient way? Yeah. All right. All right. You want to go whole hog on this bitch. Kuninchu. Kuninchu is a figure you want to focus on because it's bringing you together. You're bringing you together and bringing you together. So I would say get six candles. Mm -hmm. Have a sigil of Kuninchu on each candle. Maybe get some dirt or some sugar and... Line the candles with all that, you know, that powder you're going to make. Dress each candle with, you know, come to me or, you know, fall in love with me oil. Something romantic like that. On a full moon, perhaps if you can, on a full moon or our Mercury day of the moon or vice versa, you know, work these candles. Light them all one by one, saying this dude's name over each candle. And then once they're all lit, you know, Bring him to me. I want him to come to my feet. I want him to come to my bed. I want him to come to my house. You know, I'd be using the mudra for kunyunshio over these candles, you know, to really force my will and intent into this working, mediated by the mudra for kunyunshio. I'd say the prayer I wrote for kunyunshio to, again, amplify and focus and hone my intent. I would take some of that powder once all the candles have burned out and empowered that stuff, and line it by his front doorstep, or line it by his office, wherever he crosses over it, or wherever he can get it into his footsteps. Or if I were to make something burnable, like incense, if I knew where he lived, if I had access to his air intake system, while the fan is on, I would burn some of that incense. No joke! I've done this before. I would burn some incense by the air intake vent, so it would fill his house with my magic. Or I can make a water with it, a wash. And this is a trick from Jason Miller's book. For instance, if I were to fuck someone up, I'd make war water. First way of delivering war water, you put it in a glass bottle and you smash against their front door. Sometimes you can't do that with security systems. You get a super soaker instead and shoot from the street. So I would take a water or a wash of come hither and just spray it on his door, lining his sidewalk, sprinkling some all the way to my house. Consecrate some perfume or cologne. You know, that way, when I wear it, it's meant for him, and it's meant for him. Um, You could do it with, like, again, a piece of clothing, same thing. You could have a doll or a poppet for him, and, you know, have a poppet for you and bring you those two pops together on a base of the image or sigil for Kanyusha where you two are literally coming together. Um, lots of ways. Gosh, so many possibilities you could do. Talking to Balthazar about it, he was just like, sometimes you just gotta have a light touch when you do Yeah, magic. it's fair. I mean, sometimes if you overdo it, you're gonna blow things up. 
Yeah. Or if you overdo love working, you become obsessed with someone. You never want to overdo it at the start because A, you could be wasteful and you may not have everything you need later on. B, if you're working with spirits, they may get spoiled. And the next time you work with them, they're going to expect as much. And if you don't bring as much, they're going to be like, what's the deal? But also, why waste so much time and energy up front when a little bit will do? Try a little bit, then try a little bit more, then try a little bit more. You could just throw everything at it at once, but if you only needed... Then why would you get a bulldozer? Because you could end up bulldozing the thing you wanted. If you wanted to cook something, like you could flash fry it, absolutely. You know, really high temperature, short amount of time. Or you could cook it on a low simmer. Low amount of temperature, but a long period of time. So you can make the same prayer before you go to bed every night for 16 days. Or you could do one massive day-long ritual. It depends. I mean, is the massive day-long ritual really called for? Or could you get by just by doing a few prayers here and there? You know, what is the right thing to do? And then once you know that, what's the right way for you to do it? Because what even if you and I have the same techniques to do, the way we go about applying those techniques could be radically different. Like, I could burn a candle for any number of different purposes, but am I going to burn a candle that's just dressed a little bit of oil? Am I going to burn a candle that has coffin nails stuck into it? Am I going to burn a pink candle? Am I going to burn a white candle? Am I going to burn one candle? Am I going to burn ten candles? It depends. It's all candle magic. But do I really need to use ten candles? Do I really need to waste those coffin nails? Or can I just get by with a touch of oil? It depends. Just from all that effort, I'm thinking if we're just talking not even about magic, but law of attraction... Mm -hmm. All that effort, I mean, it seems to me like, of course he's going to come to you. You're putting out so much energy, right? Like, to me, it just makes sense that, yeah, if you really want him and you put in all that effort, the universe is definitely going to notice. This is a personal hang-up I have. The universe doesn't owe you shit. Like, that needs to be from the get-go. The universe doesn't owe you shit. You know, just because the universe notices you, Maybe, you tiny, insignificant whelp of a mite of a human, you know, the universe doesn't owe you anything. What you want to have happen is to have John, Do you know, John Doe owe you something. You want him to owe you something. You want him you want to notice. You want him to feel the energy you're putting out. The universe is going to do what the universe does. The universe doesn't give a shit about humanity. That's our job, is to make things matter for us down here. We are the kings and queens and rulers of our world. This is our world. We rule this world. We need to make the world obey us. We don't want the world to give us anything by asking nicely. No. We make our world obey us because we rule it. That's what magic is for. Magic is for assessing your dominance and your rulership over your world. Issue your edict and make it behave accordingly. That's what magic is for. My ebook does lay out a lot of these techniques. I want it to be the start of a conversation. I don't want this book to be the be all end all reference for human magic. I want it to be the start of people thinking about how else can I do magic? How else can I do my magic that I'm already comfortable with and extend it using different figures? How can I incorporate the figures into what I already do? Or how can I come up with something that's novel and new but may fit in with something else? What has been your experience in terms of the outcome of doing geomantic magic? Shit works. Shit's awesome. There's definitely a buzz I get from doing magic in general. Mm -hmm. And depending on what it exactly is I'm doing, I'll get different kinds of buzzes. And there's definitely a buzz with doing geomantic magic. But for me, it's it hits harder here for me. If I don't feel a buzz, it's probably not working. That's my rule of thumb. Sometimes it does, and I'm just not aware of it. Maybe I'm just not attuned right that day. But GNC for me, because we are made of the four elements, you know, you can work elemental magic. You can work with fire. You can work with air. But when you're working with GNC, you're really working with 
the state of the cosmos and of the bodies that are in the cosmos themselves. You're really changing the state of your own body. And if you're not careful, you will disrupt your body. Like, for instance, if you do too much fire working, you're going to have an increase in collar or yellow bile. You'll get fevers. You'll get angry. You'll get testy. If you work too much with water, and I don't work well with water, like I have a natural imbalance away from water, so for a long time, whenever I did a working with water, I would invariably get sick with a cold every single damn time. Because you're working with water, so you're bringing in phlegm, the watery humor. And those are just sin- single individual elements. With a geometric figure, you're working with a full state of manifestation unto itself. And if you're not careful, you can make yourself into that state. What's a good story of times where you used geomantic magic and the results were like, whoa? I would say my engagement with my husband. Um, I consecrated our rings uh, that I had custom made for us by a silversmith friend of mine, uh, Raven Orthavel. And I consecrated them with a specific intent for how our engagement, like, how our celebration was going to go. Because, I mean, we already were engaged at that point, but I just finally managed to get rings for the event, which managed to be our wedding rings as well. And I consecrated them with a geomantic candle ritual. Pretty simple. I was still, you know, experimenting a lot of things with geomancy. You know, for a specific end, for a special thing that happened. And it happened. And I augmented it by using green candles, because green is the color of Venus. And I was using, you know, um, the symbol Puella for a pleasant, happy time. You know, nice receptivity, nice feelings, good feelings, pleasantness, Libra, yay. You know, all that nice stuff. The engagement situation was going to happen, but I made sure it happened a special way. You made sure the ship was steered a certain way. Yes. (laughs) Ooh. How do you know that the magic has worked? Like you said that you definitely tried it and that it works. But how long did you have to wait? Does it is there a certain time frame? Like I'm guessing if you have to wait a year for it, your magic may not have been so effective. It really depends on the methods I'm using and what I'm asking about. Because sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Hmm. Because it had to get worse before it got better. Sometimes it just happens. Eh. And sometimes it doesn't happen at all. Like, that's a thing that magic I've noticed, that sometimes what you cast for, even if you pour your entire living fibers into it, you may not get it, because it wasn't right for you to get. Or you just were barking at the wrong tree. Like, there's one proverb, you can't pull, you can't uh, get fruit from a withered shoot. If it was dead in arrival, nothing you can do about it. I mean, but that's what the divination charts or the divination method is trying to help you figure out, right? Is this the right tree to be barking up? And sometimes division can be wrong, unfortunately. Like, if you're at a point where you're able to do divination readings about magic, then chances are you're already enmeshed in magic. And when you're talking about magical influences, magic can disrupt divination. It can happen. Just like how a medical in a medical prognosis the medication you're already taking can interfere with the symptoms you're showing. One of the reasons why I insist on having clarity and focus and whatnot is because there is a chance that someone or something could be interfering with your ability to divine. I know several curses off the top of my head that can prevent someone from doing divination. It can happen. And so like, if someone has a vendetta against me, they could do a curse on me to that effect. And so it's up to me as a magician to cleanse myself and ward myself, protect myself so that those things don't affect me. And that for me, that's now part of my ability to focus. So that not only am I clear up here, but my entire spiritual sphere is clear. Both of worry and anxiety and bias and curse and cross, which is why also in my ebook, I have a set of geomantic prayers, not just for the figures, but for the actual active divination itself. It's a 70, 80 page ebook, and it's super affordable. It's I think it's under $18, right? It's like $16, $18. 16 $16. Mm-hmm. And again, the first third of it is a great sort of review 
of the hermetic sort of way of thinking. The second part of it, the middle part of it, great review of how to do divination in the most effective way. And the last third are just like just instructions. Like you don't even have to like be worried about am I doing it? It's laid out how, like, what do you say? What do you do? Like, what are the, you know, the gang size of the sort of mudras that you have to do for all that sort mm -hmm. of magic. So, I mean, I really enjoyed this ebook. After reading it, I was just like, oh my God, I had no idea, you know, like, Wow. Yeah, mind blown and also expanded, right? Um, and it also changed the way that I look at all of my geomantic charts now. Like, they're, I always knew that you can change your future. I always knew that divination isn't set in stone. And yet when a system is just about divination, it's easy to forget that. Mm -hmm. But now that there's a magic system that you've sort of compiled together to put on top of that. Like I look at the chart and now I'm just like, okay, I see in this figure water's weak, but I want there to be more water because that may change this and that may change that. Especially mm -hmm. when I look at the witnesses, like in, in the chart. So now my mind, it just defaults. And I, you know, looked at two or three charts yesterday. And before I was just like, oh, this is just the way it is. It was just a subconscious thing. But then I was just like, oh, this figure. There's only one dot or two dots here, but it could turn to one dot. It could be like mm -hmm. this. It could be like that. So it's kind of like a, you know, like it changes the way that you think in a subtle way. On my blog, there's the G, G and the, uh, sorry, J. Hammond Tia posts, like the 16 posts I wrote back, back in 2014. And I actually have essentially my meditations, like what I saw, why did my path working mm. on those posts? But I mean, again, that's just my personal experience of those worlds. It really is dependent on you. Like it's so individualized. And I don't like the idea of predisposing someone to the same set of experiences that I had just because I had them. Like they have their own experience to it. And this whole point of visualization and meditation is for them to develop their own connection with the figures. So I'd want them to have the most meaningful experience that they can possibly get. Yeah, so guys, tell us in the comments below about your, yeah, about your opinion about geomantic magic, like from what you've heard. I'm sure that a lot of you, um, this is a totally new topic. It was for me. But how excited are you? to learn more about it and the answer is yes i'm super excited absolutely you should be everyone should be <laughs> everyone should be <laughs> and also like if you have been creating charts or you know if you have any sort of questions whatsoever like i love to check my comments so just leave them down below it's always such a pleasure talking to you you know i finished like more than half my glass of wine i mean come on come on get in your ball <laughs> i know seriously